Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the 6.5 Summit. It's day two here. We are in the SaaS and enterprise software track for this spotlight session. I'm Daniel Newman, one of the hosts here at the 6.5, and I'm joined by Bharat Sandhu. He's SAP Senior Vice President, and he's leading AI and application development strategy. Bharat, welcome to the 6.5 Summit. First timer, yeah? Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. We're going to have a fast-paced conversation here about AI. Uh, give us a quick background on the work you're doing at, at uh, SAP. Always interested in hearing what does leading AI and application development entail for you these days? Yeah, so at SAP, you know, like, it's, by the way, I'm, I've been here for 18 months. It's a super exciting time to be at SAP. We're going through a big transformation ourselves as we move fully to the cloud. But most importantly, the most exciting thing is, you know, I came from Microsoft you know, doing the Azure AI business there. With SAP, you know, we get to solve the real business problems. The customers run their finance books, their procurement, uh, the supply chain and everything else. And it's so exciting to actually work with customers on actually getting AI into all these mission critical applications every single day. So, the, so that's what I'm focused on. That's what the team's focused on. On the other side, we also have a thriving platform business, which is uh, what customers use to build and extend uh, the SAP applications and other business applications. So those are the two worlds I live in and, and love it every single day. Yeah, so I want to talk about kind of this rapid onset of AI, right? I mean, you, um, like me, have been following this for a while. And so, you know, before Thanksgiving, you could have said uh, chat GPT at the uh, table if you were celebrating and everyone would have been like, huh? And then sometime like in the next 30 days, it became everybody knows about it. And then by the first quarter of this year, everybody was using it, playing with it, planning their vacations, doing their shopping, writing their essays. That's something we need to talk about. But it, it kind of came out of nowhere. So it's it's been exciting. It's captured the imagine uh, imaginations of everybody. But there's more to it. What do you see going on here? Yeah, look, I think, you know, I always say, like, you know, by the way, this is not the first time it's happened. You know, like back in the day, if you remember, like when Siri first came out, uh, you know, when Show Ice in China came out, and even Tay, the, the bot back in the day, right? Humans, we are so curious by nature. That's what makes us humans. And then the second thing that makes us human is we love to communicate. Look at us. We're talking to each other right now. And what conversational AI, especially like whether the large language models or the previous versions of them, they enable people of anyone, any background, not a non-data scientist to actually touch or, or engage with AI. And that's been the fascinating thing with chat GPT in particular, right? It's that thing on steroids because now that thing has been trained on vast amount of knowledge, you know, a lot, lot of internet data. And it's out of curiosity, like what can this thing do? Can let me engage, right? So that humans, we love to engage and we love to talk. And now AI with chat GPT and just generative AI technologies, large language models has really opened up a whole new realm of AI that has made it more relevant uh, for a large variety of large population. Everybody actually, I was with my parents the other day at dinner table and we had the chat GPT app open. Uh, and we were asking questions about like, is this phrase commonly used in this language or that language? So it's almost become an assistant and it's just become so tangible instead of a esoteric AI. And it happened so quickly. And it's funny because you kind of mentioned Siri and you mentioned like, you know, I've been generative AI has kind of been part of my life. We use Google Workspace and, and Google has been finishing my sentences for a long time. And that was a version of generative AI. You know, when you when you know you do multi-turn conversation with an Alexa, that is a version of generative AI. But to your point, these new LLMs and these new search uh, tools have kind of unlocked the imagination and democratized would be the word I would use. Or it's like, everyone's like, oh, okay, I see, I get. Um, and it's, it's, it's good to see that progress. But you know, in your mind, what is different about generative AI really than, than, than past techniques? You know, because like I said, it, it's kind of been there for a while. So how do you explain the real difference yeah. besides just commercialization? Yeah, I'll give you two examples, right? Like, so if you ever used Uber, you used AI because you had to like, you know, get a ride, they had to match you with a driver, get the route optimization. Actually, if our SAP customers use AI every single day for people like, I'll give you, if you ever use Concur and if you travel, you have to file expenses, you've been scanning receipts for a long time, or I hope you have been. <laughs> I've not been entering them manually. And also in the background, doing audit checks in a supply chain, you know, AI is used to match suppliers with their needs and recommend suppliers and so forth. But the fact of the matter is all this has been narrow AI and we, and that's actually been a blessing because AI really was meant to be hidden. Uh, so enhance your applications, enhance your interface, you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't know using AI. So what's changed generative AI is not doing a narrow thing anymore. 
it's more general purpose AI, and this specifically with large language models, you can ask just about anything, right? So, so it's that's what has really changed. Instead of like even the Siri and the, the Alexa of the, the world, you would get tired. You could play music, you could look at the weather, but there's not much engagement going on. Now these large language models allow us to do that, and this really made AI a thing, where it previously was very much more hidden behind the scenes. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. And it's something that you at your recent SAP Sapphire, the company came out really talking about business AI. And yes. I like that a lot. You know, I've written a lot of pieces. I was tending to use the word enterprise AI and, and it really kind of set something off in my mind because, you know, as a smaller company, we announced our uh, generative AI platform doing AI yes. analysts and AI analytics. And I'm saying like, you know, yeah, we will be an enterprise someday, but we're like, you know, not quite a hundred people. So we're kind of on that cusp of, are you an enterprise? But we are a business, you That's know right. what I mean? And so right. I, I think that while we've heard so much about generative to plan a vacation, generative to pick your favorite music, generative to, you know, one of the big opportunities is we've had what, 2% of the world's data is being utilized in some way. I've, I've heard three, two, one, but for businesses to start applying that massive set of data, much of which SAP has, there's this huge opportunity for right. business AI and generative to create next level customer experiences, better insights, uh, help executives make better decisions, AI in your boardroom, all those things. Talk a little bit about your perspective on that. Yeah, you know, business AI for us means two things. One is exactly what you said. It's not the size of the organization. It's actually you running, you, any organization of any size has customers of some kind, has five, revenue coming in, costs going out. So you've got to balance books and everything else. Those things are common. And those are the things which we're using AI to really help customers just run better. So it's not the size of the business. The second important thing, we've been very clear, we're in the market of business AI. What that means is you get out of the box on day one, AI capabilities built into your finance, supply chain, procurement, HR systems. That's not to say you can't have enterprise AI systems that are great platforms, right? There are a lot of great companies that provide a lot of platforms that data science teams and machine learning engineers use, that's awesome. Our focus is not that. Our focus is to give the, the CFO the best final solution that closes the books the fastest so they can report the results to the street as quickly as possible with the highest level of confidence. They can do forecasting. They can manage costs. They can manage the liquidity and so, so forth. Right. So for us, business AI becomes of all sizes of organizations in all industries, but it's really solving business problems out of the box. And it's, you know, and we're really fortunate. Uh, one of the biggest things I really value about SAP is the depth of our customer relationships. The customers literally run their businesses on SAP systems. They've been doing it for 50 years and we've learned a lot. We, of course, we have a lot of like, specified, specific data for finance and all that, but we have a lot of domain knowledge. So we've been able to bake the data and domain knowledge now using generative AI, but give to customers in the solutions they use. So they don't need to have data science teams, machine learning engineering teams, because they get these capabilities out of the box. And these are business AI capabilities that they get. And that's something we do. We run, help customers run their businesses. And now we're using AI to do that much better. And, and I think, you know, you can start to make AI as accessible as some people might say a SaaS, like you, you, know, you talked mm -hmm. about Concur earlier, an expense solution, easy to deploy, and it made uh, expense management accessible to every business on the planet. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I think a lot of companies need from AI. They don't have the data scientists. They don't understand the data pipeline. They don't have... Uh, racks full of GPUs. They don't know how to code in in in, in Python and develop okay. it, you know, or um, you know. So one of the things though that you I'd like you to speak to though, only because it's you know not too far out from Sapphire, mm -hmm. is the company made a lot of announcements and partnerships. So yes. you know you made announcements and partnerships with um, I believe Microsoft. You made a partnership and announced with Google. You know, first of all, talk just a bit about the partnerships and, and two, why? Why is SAP going down the route of partnering as opposed to maybe right. trying to build out and do everything itself? Yeah, and we're doing both, right? So like the, it's, uh, and I always say like, it's like very fascinating when you're working in the business applications layer because what we then get to do is use the best technologies in the world and they can change over time and they do change over time. So when it comes to general purpose AI, whether it's a great NLP classification algorithm or whether it's like the generative AI technology. You know, we are working with Microsoft, we're working with Google, we're working with IBM and a plethora of organizations. We do that and then we kind of fine tune these models and choose which models to use. We actually also use a lot of open source models, by the way. 
and we develop our own expertise in doing natural language processing for tax documents and things like that, right? But we build upon these general purpose technologies on the market, fine tune them or, or develop our own if needed to solve business needs and then bake them into our solutions. So customers don't need to worry about what to use, what not to use. We've done the hard work. So customers don't need to do that. And because we have access to all these customers and more importantly, the customer data and, and the domain knowledge, that's why all the companies are eager to also partner with SAP and we're very honored to do that. And you know, we really get to benefit from all the great technology investments happening on the general purpose AI space, whether it's open AI or whether it's open source and so forth. And we really get to do that, take the complexity out for the customer, just help them hire better, retain employees better and, and close books faster. So first of all, you know, I fundamentally believe Bharat, that we are going to see just like kind of with multi-cloud, we're going to see multi-gen AI. Yes. Okay. And, yes. and the reason this is, is because there's so much value across different platforms and different large language models. And of course, you're going to see the cascading models, yes. you know, of large language, medium, small language models, micro models. And of course, yes. we know that the better the large language model gets, the, the less data you need to train those the subsequent models. Yeah. And companies are going to be able to get more value, do more training on less. And by the way, that's a good sustainability story because if you can start training models with less data, it's less power. There's so much goodness inside of all that. So I want to point that out. Speaking of so much goodness, speaking of sustainability, let's flip to regulation for just a minute here. Um, you know, there's... I watched Sam Altman from OpenAI on the Hill. I, I went on BBC and a bunch of other networks, and I talked about what's going to happen here. I would love to get your take because you know the 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 regulatory uh, environment seems to kind of have multiple schools of thought. Some are mm -hmm. like, "Yeah, we need to regulate this." Some mm -hmm. are like, "Well, we need to regulate this, but there's no way we can regulate this." Mm -hmm. Then, of course, there's another school that's like, "Why mm -hmm. even bother?" You know, mm -hmm. like just go because the Inter industry will move so much quicker. Kind of what's your take? What's SAP's yeah. position on regulation? Yeah, look, I'll, I'll talk about what we're doing at SAP, but just in general, right? With any new technologies, it's always good to actually do, uh, have a very thoughtful approach to it. And actually most industry leaders have come out saying, yeah, we do need some regulation. And, and you know, and we do have multiple committees in different countries that work with the local uh, regulators to understand what it requires. Actually, one of the things that make SAP also unique is our software is used in all different countries, but you know what? Everyone has a different tax law. Everyone has a different labor law. So we've always got to know how to tune our services to the unique needs of every single region, even without AI. But because of that, we are also applying under AI. When it comes to applying AI in a responsible and ethical fashion, we really follow four things. First, we have an independent ethics committee. Before we even develop any AI use case, we evaluate it and the ethics committee has to give us a green light. Uh, and a lot of cases we don't pursue because, you know, we, we'll, we will not be able to do it in an ethical fashion. So there's, a, there's one uh, big check up front. Then second one is the AI technology we use. And you said it, it's multi-gen <laughs> multi AI, right? But there are multiple technologies and we want to make sure when we use any AI technology, customer's data is not used to train a broader model. That's super important for us. It's only used for inferencing. Third one, we control the UX. Because we're doing business AI, because it's being served in success factor for helping customers recruit faster or, or screen uh, other things, uh, you know, interview candidates better and so, so forth. The, 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 the surface area for misuse is really dramatically down because it's not a free flowing thing. And finally, in our AI approach, we always have human in the loop. So I'll give an example. Something we announced at Sapphire is, you know, a lot of us hire candidates, but we don't do it for a living. We don't every day wake up in the morning saying, I'm going to hire five people today. Or 10 people today. So we don't, are, you know, at least I'm not that good at writing job descriptions. But now we're using success factor data with the job requirements, with this in depth skill ontology that we have in success factor to create amazing job descriptions using generative AI. But we fine tune it, we make sure it, it doesn't use wrong words or biased words, but then there's a human in the loop review before it gets published. So those are the ways we're basically able to make sure we don't A, develop a use case. That could be, you know, not misused. But B, when we launch any use case, as human in the loop at the end to make sure the generation in this case has been reviewed by a human and then approved. Uh, so it's not all autopilot. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think there's a big opportunity though to really lead the way. And what I will say is, well, 
I think regulatory will tend to follow because we're seeing whether it's internet, whether it's been mobile yeah. or social, sure. um, it's taken a long time. So I do think the industry needs to take a big leadership role That's on good. things like ethics and regu uh, regulating itself, making sure models don't drift, transparency mm -hmm. in the models. I think a lot of that stuff's going to be important. And I expect the industry to step up and do that stuff. Um, I only have a couple minutes here left with you. And, uh, you know, I, I, I heard a rumor that uh, you wanted to ask me <laughs> the last question, which would make you the first person ever on a 6-5 Summit interview to ask the uh, ask the analyst. But uh, let me just tell you, your, your head of AR, Clara, she's, a, she's someone I respect a lot. So I told her I would let this slip. One time, this one time. One time. Even in the in the era of generative AI, it's good for the candidate to also generate a question for the <laughs> interviewee. Um, look, I'm just curious, and you've been following this space for a long time, and I've been following your work actually also. Uh, what are you personally most excited about, about, about AI going forward? Yeah, you know, I've thought a lot about it. And, you know, I think we're all going through these ebbs and flows of how we feel. At first, I looked at it and I said, wow, we could run a really lean operation. Like so many things mm -hmm. could be done with less. You know, it's the do more with less thing. Yeah. And then I thought to myself, what about do more with more? Meaning mm -hmm. why is generative AI being immediately looked at as like a, a slash and burn strategy instead of saying like, for instance, as analysts, we create lots of thought leadership, research content. And, you know, you can only produce so much. You can only tweet yeah. so much. You can only go on TV so many times. I'm excited about the fact that I can go exponential with generative AI. I can yeah. create once and use generative to do dozens and hundreds of different versions, short shortcuts. It could mm -hmm. take my body of work and videos. And so I'm really excited about how it's going to enable growth and productivity yeah. um, with the same effort. Meaning that, you know, when you so when you're someone that works really hard, you can benefit by getting exponentially more output. Yes. And I think for me, that's probably the one thing that's been most exciting, but it took me a little while to not think about it. Like, do I spend one tenth as much to do something or do I create 10 yes. times more yes. and spend the same? And I think it was finally coming to the realization that generative AI could help with the latter and help educate the world, democratize the knowledge base that we create here as analysts, and then hopefully provide more and more value. And I got a couple of secrets that I can't reveal here yet of how we're going to do that and how we're going to shake up this industry. But maybe as a very last question, Brock, before I let you go, what about you? What's the thing that you're going to do with generative AI or that you want to see from generative yeah. AI that's going to change the way you work or change the world in some way? There are two ways, I think. So like, you know, um, one is actually, I think I would love for the AI to kind of also go back into blending behind the scenes a little bit. Uh, you know, we'll take all the hype right now, but it's most productive and it's behind the scenes. I'll give an example. One of the solutions we launched at, at, at Sapphire was transportation management. What is that? You know, one of the biggest challenges we have with any company has is like, you know, truckloads coming to a warehouse. Somebody has to offload the stuff, but then there's a long doc piece of documents like, this is what I delivered, or this is what I'm picking up. And that has to be manually entered. You know, the frontline workers have to do it. Sometimes data entry errors, a lot of cost. With large language models, you're not generating anything, generating anything, but we're using this expertise to understand language to match the fields, to automate the entire process in any country, in any any template and so so forth. So all of a sudden, all the companies that had like you know just stacks of paper to process, not anymore. Just scan thing has gone there, right? So again, but they don't know using generative AI. We use generative AI and actually a very simple model to do that. But but we've kind of baked it behind the scenes. I would love for more of the business capabilities, business impact to happen, but customers don't even know they're using AI or generative AI. Personally, in my personal life though, I'm a big sci-fi fan. So I can't wait for a true digital assistant to talk to in the morning uh, and say, and read the news and have a conversation as I'm getting ready what we see in the movies every single day. I think that'd be super cool once we're able to get to that level. Absolutely. And and Virat, it's been so much fun chatting to you. I could see us talking for another, yeah. this, this could go on for a while. Um, however, there's so much more day to go here at the 6.5 Summit. So I've got to say goodbye for now. Yes. But thank you so much for joining us. Let's do it again sometime soon. Yeah. Take care. Thank you for having me. All right, everybody. There you have it. It's day two here. We are at the 6.5 Summit. This is the SaaS Enterprise Software track. But we did talk quite a bit about software. We talked a little bit there about AI too. But hey, who could talk about anything right now in the tech space without getting into AI? Stay with us, everyone, though. We've got so many more sessions. Catch them all on demand if you can't catch them in real time. We appreciate you tuning in. More soon.